Hello, dear friends. I would like to talk about Parsha Korach in the book of Bamidbar. Korach's attempt to overthrow the position of Moses, which is a watershed moment for Moses, for Moshe Rabbeinu. And I want to explain why, why it's such an important moment for Moshe Rabbeinu in his leadership. To understand this better, we have to turn back the clock. Moshe Rabbeinu grew up in Pharaoh's palace. He knew his sister, who had suggested to Pharaoh's daughter to find him uh, a, a woman from the Hebrews, who turned out to be his mother, Yochebed, according to the Midrash, and probably according to the Psuki. And he knew Aaron, his brother, who he met later in life again. But he didn't really know the Hebrews very much, but he did grow up in the palace. And when you grow up in the palace, he was probably a well-known personality. People looked up to him. He was Pharaoh's adopted son, just like Pharaoh's real son. He knew everybody. He was part of the elite. And in fact, a lot of people in that situation wouldn't be in such a hurry to connect to their Hebrew brethren. They would rather stay in the palace. That would ruin everything if people associated him with the other Hebrews. They're the slaves. They're the nobodies. He's a somebody. He's more than a somebody. He's in the royal family. Well, the verse says then in Exodus in Shmot, Vayigdal ha'ish vayetzei alachav. The man grew up and he went out to his brethren, it says. What does it mean he went out to his brethren? He considered them brethren despite the fact that he was in the palace. He knew that going out to his brethren was a risk. First of all, he is a Hebrew. He could easily tarnish his name now by associating with them. Besides, he might be considered as somebody who is a traitor now. Maybe he's planning something. This is a big risk. And his Bayar Basivalatam, he sees their persecution. And then he sees an Egyptian, um, an Egyptian officer, an Egyptian policeman hitting in a vicious way a Hebrew slave, and he can't take it. He looks right and left, and he smites the Egyptian and buries him in the sand. Rav Yaakov ben Asher Turim, called the Bala Turim, in a very short commentary on that verse, he says, the word Hamitsri, the Egyptian, in numerical value is the same numerical value as the word Moshe, Moses, which means that Moshe at that point, by smiting the Egyptian, he de facto has smitten the Egyptian part of his personality because now he might never be able to go back to the palace. He's not now Moses, the adopted son anymore. It's just a matter of time till somebody finds out and he is going to be arrested. But he goes back to the palace and he comes out the next day to see what's going on. He's already done something for the Egyptian, for the Hebrews. Maybe they will now see him as a savior. That's what he wants to do. He wants to, re, he wants to lead that revolt. Besides, who else can do it? One of the Hebrew slaves? They don't even have the backbone to do it. They hear that crack of the whip and they're gone. He grew up in the palace. He grew up a free man. He's educated. He has belief. He has, he knows everybody. Everybody, all the who's who of the upper echelons of Egypt, he all, he all knows them by the first name. If anybody could lead this, these people in revolt, it's him. And there's a lot of people there. According to the book of Numbers, there were six, over 600,000 men between the ages of 20 and 60, that means add that to that the women and the children, you have a million and a half to two million people, the numbers they have, the know-how he has, the connection he has, let's do it. So he goes out that second day. And now he takes up a leadership role in his own mind. He sees two Hebrews fighting thinks that's ridiculous. It's enough that Egyptians are persecuting you. Now you're fighting between yourselves. He turns to them. The guy hitting is the other guy. He says, 
Why are you hitting him? What are you doing? The man looks back at him and says to him, without knowing maybe who Moses is, or even knowing that he might be a Hebrew, he says, Mi samcha aleinu. Who appointed you as a minister and as a judge over us? Are you, going, are you saying you're going to kill me the way you killed the Egyptian? Moses hears that, says to himself, whoa, that means this is known that I killed the Egyptian. And he runs away to Midian. Now, this is a pivotal moment in Moses' life, hearing uh, because he wanted to make the revolt. He wanted to be the leader. He thought the people would understand right away. He's dressed as an Egyptian of the royal family and he's helping them. Wouldn't they want to help? Are they that far gone that they don't even want to end the slavery? Moses is in shock. And from that moment on, he really feels like they'll never believe him because he's not one of them. They don't get it. Years later, when God sends him and it says, you you know, go to Pharaoh and go to the leaders of Israel. Moses says, they won't believe me. And God says, okay, then show them these three signs. The three signs being the staff that turns into uh, a serpent and the water, which turns into blood for the Nile and the leprous hand, which is number two, actually, of the three. And even and at Sinai, and the whole time Moses has this feeling of inferiority complex vis-a-vis the people. Only at Sinai does God say to Moses, God says to Moses, and they, the Hebrews, will now believe in you forever. The Israelites will believe in you. God has to reassure Moses. He's not sure if they really do. He has no problem talking Pharaoh. Pharaoh, he knows all about. If it's not Pharaoh, it'll be his son, but he knows all these guys. It's the Hebrews, the Israelites, he has a problem with. So these guys make their statement. Moses realized it's just a matter of hours now until he's going to be um, caught. He runs off to Midian. But the statement that these fellows make to him is almost prophetic. Because what do they say? Who appointed you as a leader, a minister, and as a judge over us? Which is exactly what's going to happen. Moses will be the leader, as if the minister of the Jewish people. And he also becomes the judge. Eventually, he appoints 70 judges under him. But he's both the minister and the judge. Let's continue what they say. Are you saying you're going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? Number one, uh, are you saying you're going to kill us? You know, the Midrash brings an interesting Midrash, the rabbinic interpretation. Why did they say, are you saying you're going to kill us? So the Midrash says, because Moses used a name of God to smite the Egyptian. I mean, he had some mystical powers and used one of the holy names of God to smite the Egyptian. I don't know if that's the simple meaning of the verse. And I don't really want to dwell at the moment on the question of whether that Midrash is a simple meaning of that verse either. But <clears throat> what I do want to say is that it's interesting to note that after this Egyptian, all the punishments that were enacted against the Egyptians, against the enemies of Israel, or against sinners within Israel during Moses' lifetime were never done physically by Moses. They were always done by a statement that he made. It was always by the word, never physical. And then the last thing that they say, are you, are you saying you're going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? Not only did he kill that Egyptian, he killed the entire Egyptian army at the sea, what we call the Red Sea. And of course, the 10 plagues. So this statement is literally a prof- prophetic statement of what's going to happen. Now, I don't think these two individuals were prophets, but just like Joseph, when he was a young man, he received dreams. And in that second dream, 
which Joseph did not understand. The sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to him, and he couldn't understand it. And he told to his brothers and to his father, because he had difficulty understanding it, says his father remembered the dream. Only much later in Joseph's life, when the brothers come to him in Egypt, it says that Joseph remembered the dreams. And they tell him, and he tells them to bring also Benjamin. Something like that is happening now. Moses is hearing a statement. He doesn't realize it's almost a prophetic statement about his life. And these guys don't realize it either. But God wants Moses to have a cue about what's going to happen eventually. Because he realizes that Moses wants to lead the revolt. But obviously it's not yet time. But he wants to give Moses a hint of that it's going to happen. But I'm not sure that Moses understood the message at that point. And Moses fled to Midian. Now, how old was Moses when he fled to Midian? And the man grew up, it says Ish, not Nar. So he was probably more than his teens. Nar is usually in the teens at the most. So maybe he was 20, maybe 25, let's say even 30, probably not more than that. Because it says he grew up, it just sounds too much if he's 30. More than 30 at least. And how old was he when he went, to, uh, when he went uh, back to Egypt? We know that. It says in the book of Shemot, in Exodus, he was 80 years old. Aaron was 82. So, what does this mean? Moses wanted his brethren to revolt. He wanted to lead that revolt. And he was absolutely right that he was the best prepared person to lead, re, to lead that revolt. But the Hebrews, or at least the ones he met, didn't seem to be ready. Moses goes to Midian. Okay, hopefully God will show me a sign. And he's there for a year, five years, gets married, has two children, 10 years, 15, 20, 30, 40. 50 years. Assuming he left at 30, if he left at 20, it's 60 years. All those years that went by, Moses was probably thinking, God, I wanted to do this. I wanted to, I was willing to give my life to help them, to take them out. I saw their persecution, so you definitely saw their persecution. What's going on? But what can you do? Then one day, at the age of 80, he walks out to the Mount of Horeb and he sees a bush burning and not consumed. And uh, he, God says to him, Moses says yes. And he covers his face, says, I heard the suffering of my people Israel. And Moses is probably thinking, now you heard. <laughs> I mean, I knew about that 50 years ago. <laughs> now, what's going on? But he doesn't say anything out of respect. Says, I shall take them out of Egypt. I'll take them out of the persecution. And I will uh, save them from the labor I shall, I shall redeem you with an outstretched arm meaning the Jewish people and I shall bring you to the land all these things he says and he turns to Moses and he says Moses I'm sending you to Egypt you're going to take them out Moses is thinking now <laughs> when I was young and had energy and good looking I could have done the job. I was ready. I'm an old man now. I'm 80 years old. Now I'm going to go. So Moses doesn't want to say that. Instead, he says, I'm a stutter. I can't really talk. Yeah, maybe find somebody who can talk. God says, don't worry. Aaron will be with you. He'll talk whenever you have difficulties. That's not the answer Moses wanted. He's still frustrated. He doesn't understand what's going on. Moses says, you know what, God? send somebody else. I had my time. It's not now. 
says, Vayichar, God got angry with Moses. You're going to go. That's it. And Moses goes. And Moses goes. Because Moses realizes that obviously God calls the shots and not human beings. And that's a very difficult thing for a person to realize. It's not for no reason that it says Moses was the most humble of all individuals on this planet. It takes great, great humbleness. You were willing to give your life 50 years ago and now you don't know what's going to happen, but God said you go and you go. And now we come to Parsha Korach. Now Korach is now doing what Moshe feared the most, a revolt, an attempt to overthrow Moses as the leader. But now the time has come for Moses to realize that he's the leader and not have these inferiority complex anymore. And what happens? Korach. Korach is a Levite. All the people mentioned here were, you might say, shortchanged by the leadership of Moshe. The Levites, because Aaron and Moses were for the tribe of Levi, but only Aaron began the kihuna, the priesthood. So only the descendants of Aaron are uh, priests and not the descendants, for instance, of um, Kahat, which was the grandfather of Korach. So that's the first one, Korach. According to, um, by the way, I must mention one other thing. It's very important. In Midrashic material. And Rashi brings this Midrash, the Midrash Rabbah. It says, who were those two Hebrews who Moses saw fighting and said to them, why are you hitting each other? And who are those two Hebrews who said to Moses, who appointed you as a minister? and as a judge of, of, uh, over us. According to the Midrash, they were Datan and Avira, who are sort of like troublemakers through the whole 40 years, or at least until their demise. So let's go back to Korach. Korach, first of all, is upset. The priesthood, he can't even get the priesthood because it's from another line of Levi. Who goes with him? Datan and Aviram, which according to Midrash are those same two Hebrews who doubted Moses right from the beginning. Now just think of the chutzpahs who say the audacity. Okay, you doubted him when you didn't know who he was, but now after the 10 plagues and the splitting of the Red Sea, the Tan Aviram, who said those st that statement to Moses before Moses was known as Moses, they can still say to him at this point, why are you trying to um, promote yourself over the Israelites? Is there any doubt in anybody's mind that there's that he's the only one who really should be the leader at this point? The audacity of it is just unbelievable. So aside from Korach, you have Datan and Aviram, the sons of Eliyahu, and then who are from the tribe of Reuben, and then you had On ben Pellet, who are also from the tribe of Reuben. Remember, Reuben was a firstborn, whereas this takes us back to the book of Genesis where you have the fight in the family of Jacob, who's supposed to be the firstborn and the continuation of the Jacob family. Is it Reuven, who was the firstborn of Leah? Is it Joseph, who was the firstborn of Rachel? Or because Reuven sinned and Shimon of Levi sinned, is it Judah? And I talked about this in the book of uh, Genesis and also the beginning of the book of Bamidbar, where eventually the Levites replace the firstborn. So. And also under Moses. So here, first, the Kohanim replace, uh, or be, become higher than Levim on the, on the uh, scale of sanctify, uh, sanctity, if you want to put it that way, and Korach doesn't like that. And you have two people from the tribe of, three people from the tribe of Reuven who say, we should have been the ones who were sanctified because originally the firstborn were. What's this whole business, the tribe of Levite? So they also joined the party. And then you have 250 um, it says, da Moed, 250 VIPs, aristocrats <clears throat> from the Jewish people, people who are well known. And according to the Chizkuni and other sources, they were firstborn. Part of those firstborn who were usurped by the Levim, 
who took over um, their birthright as if to be leaders and the, the whole tribe of Levi was instead. So these were people, if you want, who were shortchanged by Moses' leadership. And they were all convinced by Korach to join in in the party against Moses. Of course, it's, and what do they say? If everybody in the Jewish people is holy, so who are you to be in charge? Of course, when, who are you to be in charge? Meaning, we should be in charge. <laughs> it's always like that. It's not just who are you to be in charge. Now, there's really a lot to say here, and I don't want to go into too much. But as I said, this is the watershed moment, because this is now when Moses, who now understands that he is the leader, has to stand up to them. At the beginning, he falls on his face because he remembers this feeling of inferiority that he always has. But then <clears throat> Moses stands up to them and he said, in the morning, God will show who is sanctified, meaning who the Kohanim, the priests are supposed to be. And the one that he chose, not me, and that will happen. And he also says to them, Rav Lachem B'nei Levi, isn't it enough, Levites, meaning Korach, why do you need to be priests too? Because right away Moses realized that this is personal. It's because they want leadership roles. It has nothing to do about his own flaws. But Moses also realizes at this point what the meaning of his own leadership was. And why God did not choose him when he was a young man. But Moses understands now is what exactly says the Korach about him and Aaron. V'nachnu ma ki talino aleinu. What are we that you're complaining against us? The meaning of that is, and that goes together with the fact the humbleness of Moses. Moses now realizes that it's not he is the leader. It's not about him. God wanted to take the Jews, the Israelites, out of Egypt. It's true. Moses was ready when he was 20 or 30. And uh, maybe something could have happened then. But the problem was that Moses wanted to be the redeemer. Like every young man who is an idealist and wants even if it's a good revolt and for a good reason, it's a bit of ego here. We want to do it. We want to change the world. It was not God who was not ready when Moses was 30. It was Moses who was not ready. It's almost like God is saying to Moses, Moses, you were ready, but it's not about you. You are my emissary to take the Israelites out of Egypt but I am taking them out of Egypt. And until that's 100% clear, I can't send you. I can't even take the risk that they might see you as a redeemer because it's not about you. It's about God and the Jewish people. That's why every year in our Passover Haggadah, there's one personality who's not mentioned in that Exodus story, and that's Moshe. To teach us, Anivalo Malach, Anivalo Saraf, God says, I took you out of Egypt. Moses was the Shaliach, he was the emissary. And this is the watershed moment, the moment when Moses realized that his leadership is a representative of God. And it's not that God wasn't ready then, he wasn't ready. And now he was, and he can stand up to Korah because now he realizes. There's nothing personal here. Everything that's happening, this ends under divine decisions. And then Korach is playing a very dangerous game of fire here. And Moses just steps back and God calls the shots. Shalom, shalom. <laughs>